Hi everyone, my name is Aaron Smith. I'm the CEO of EVA. I want to welcome you to the 2021 Summit. It's so great to see all of you in person. Um, we're joined by several hundred people online. As we put this conference together, we, we had to go with a hybrid conference. Last year we had to pivot relatively quickly to a virtual conference. But I think the thing that we found is that virtual expands our mission. It expands our community uh, as EBA. It's allowed people, you know, EBA was traditionally a North American organization. So we had great members in the United States and Canada. And we now have um, builders, architects, energy raters from 60 countries around the world that have been able to join on our mission for healthier, electric, resilient, decarbonized, net zero homes, whatever your personal mission is in your business. So that's really exciting. For those of you that can't be here in person, I think we have 236 people here in person, which blew away our expectation during COVID. Uh, but here's the thing I'll tell you that's really unique. How many of you have gone through this? When you're meeting people for the first time, they're much tinier, aren't they? Everybody I met, I was like, they're a really tiny person. Because there's something about the, the Zoom or it makes everyone look bigger. So I'm, you know, I'm really tiny and really thin in real life. The camera adds, what, 20 pounds, something like that. But it's been great to see everybody uh, in person. We've got a great session today. Um, we've got, a, we have, I think, 49 sessions total over the two and a half days. We've got over 60 speakers. And, and with a hybrid, I mean, there are, I'm in here all day, all week, right? There are great sessions that I wanna see. Every session will be recorded. It'll be available to you to review. I think it's for 60 days after the summit. It'll be available on the EBA Academy uh, in our learning management system for long term. Uh, you have continuing education units from a host of our partners like AIA and BPI and ResNet. I'm probably forgetting a few. Uh, so if you need forms, they're in the back. Otherwise, we can get you those forms uh, if you're in the online audience as well. So absolutely fantastic to be here. Um, as we look back, I started in January of 2019 with EBA. And on March 12th, the world changed for all of us. Or at least my world changed because the NHL shut down on, on March 12th. So I think NBA too, right? But that was really the day that changed everything. And everyone had to pivot to online. But one of the first um, EBA webinar series that we had was on human health impact from Dr. John McCune. And Train sponsored that um, speaker. Uh, it was from Allergy Standards Limited out of Ireland. And we had Dr. McCune uh, speak to all of us in a webinar series. And you can still see that original webinar up on eba.org. I think for a Zoom webinar, we had 342 people come to that that wanted to learn how do I build healthier. And this was the first time we really had a medical doctor come in and explain uh, the importance of human health, um, asthma and allergy as a proxy for dealing with COVID at that time. So out of that, the EBA board told me, we need to understand more about uh, healthier homes and we would like to create a course. So we worked with Dr. McCune and we created a, the Healthier Homes Awareness for Building Professionals course. And that course is up on eba.org today. Um, and I think that uh, many, many of you have taken that course and learned more. And it, it's, it's the health impact and the building science together, but it's also some empathic sales skills for not just the builder or the project manager. It could be for um, the architect, could be for the real estate agent that's in the model home and understanding what people's needs are. So we're really excited to develop that program. And with that, uh, Cooper, if we're ready, maybe we can roll that intro video of uh, Dr. McKinn. As the world gets noisier and more uncertain, there's a great opportunity to invest in yourself around this issue about healthy living in indoor spaces and how do we design a better built environment. The EPA suggests that indoor air quality, IAQ, can be up to five times more polluted than outdoor air. For many years now, indoor air quality has been managed from an engineering, energy efficiency and mechanical ventilation point of view only. 
This programme considers indoor air from a people-centred point of view. We will teach you the indoor air quality and its relationship with the airborne transmission of diseases, such as coronavirus, is actually a proxy for having good quality, healthy air for everyone indoors. So I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. John McCune with Allergy Standards Limited, um, streaming in live from Ireland. Dr. McCune. Aaron, good afternoon, good morning to all the people looking around the world. Uh, apologies for the little technical glitch, but I would like to congratulate Cooper and Nancy and Luden and your team over there, just to think that you're, you're in the US uh, Gord's in Canada and we're in Ireland, but we made it happen. A slight delay, but, but, but we're here now. So um, let me dive straight into my slide. So with the magic of technology, I'm going to start sharing my screen and just get it up in presentation mode. Um, and just so just do a check, Cooper, if anybody can tell me, is my audio coming through okay? The volume's okay and everything? Loud and clear? Okay, I'll yeah, proceed with that. We're good, great. Okay, so again, apologies for the delay, but what I, what I would really like to do is just build on, on Aaron's uh, uh, opening there about this real concept now that the world mm -hmm. is switched on about healthy indoor air and as building professionals and people related to the building industry, how this is really important and how it's very innovative and where the future is. So just to tell you a little bit about, um, just get my slide advanced there. One second now, it doesn't seem to be working. I have to get the keyboard. <clears throat> now, if uh, just tell you a little bit about cells. One second, there we go. Okay, we're up. So as I mentioned, the Allergy Standards are our company and we're related to design thinking, innovation, all things that optimize the health of the indoor environment. What we're probably most famous for in America is our product certification program which identifies consumer products which are more suitable for people with asthma and allergies and the broader air aware consumer. But really all the things that we certify go in to the built environment, things like textile products, cleaning products, building materials. So we've really transitioned our business now to look at the, the built environment in general. Why we started with asthma and allergies is to try and put it in, into, into numbers. If you add the six most common disease states in the US uh, all together, you wouldn't have the same amount of people that have, who are impacted by asthma and allergies. And then when you look at that on a household basis, either a sibling or a parent or a relative, it's about one in, one in two. So up to 50% of households are impacted by this issue. So that's why we started our journey within asthma and allergies. Um, and as I said, we've now broadened it because air is important to everybody. We all breathe. And we've also felt that there's been a great hunger, as Aaron mentioned at the beginning there, for education. Um, and knowledge. And during the pandemic, we've seen a lot of companies, a lot of industries really investing in their people. There's been this kind of resignation wave running through America and big companies and the best company realize they must invest in their people for that loyalty and they feel engaged in their, in their business around non-technical capabilities like leadership, like innovation. And we think this whole concept of healthy indoor air is part of that movement as well. So we've, we've pivoted our business a lot into education and knowledge experts. So where did this story all kind of come together? Well, I actually personally turned 50 years old this year. So um, last year was the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Clean Air Act, which gave rise to the EPA and was also the 50th year of Earth Day. Um, and you'll see there the amount of, of lives or deaths prevented, lives saved, deaths presented because of this. So there's always been a connection between outdoor air, energy efficiency, and indoor air. And really, the COVID has accelerated that trend. And the title of this, of this talk today is about being healthy, wealthy, and wise. And what we're really saying is, if we get wise and knowledgeable and really understand, and uh, as Aaron said at the beginning there, from an empathy point of view, really put ourselves in the shoes of our customers when we're designing the built environment 
we will make sure they are healthy, we will make sure our communities are healthy, and then obviously that will be good for business and we become wealthy ourselves. And that's, that's good, that's good professional, purpose-driven professional leadership, which impacts and improves society. So to use Zig Ziglar's expression, this concept of if we can actually help enough people get what they want, we can everything we want in our professional and our personal lives. Um, and that's a great American ideal, it's a great American concept, and people want good homes. So it's our professional leadership position to help them achieve that. The issue is there's a lot of complexity out there in the world and there's a lot of uncertainty around this area and it's moving fast. The, the pace of change today is as fast as it's ever been, but it's also the slowest it'll ever be. It will only accelerate. So as Maya D'Angelo would say, you know, we do our best as professionals on what we know, but then we're always learning, we're always investing in ourselves, and then when we know better, we will do better. And that's this expression that you hear used a lot and more and more, this VUCA world we live in. It's volatile, this level of uncertainty and ambiguity, uh, complexity and networks and ambiguity, artificial intelligence, and so on and so forth, blockchain, etc. So that is the world we live in, and that is the world that's us as professional leaders uh, to show innovation and, and leadership. And we see things like the outdoor environment and these harmful weather effects, and we know that they're, they are increasing in, in, in their frequency and in their severity, whether it's tragically in California or then it was in Australia, and now in Europe, in Turkey, most recently, we're seeing a lot of these forest fires and other adverse weather events that are switching people onto this whole concept of our planet being connected and our air being connected. Uh, in the UK, it was a tragic death during the summer of this, this, young, this young girl in, in London. Um, and this was actually the first time ever that the coroner's verdict of death was due to bad air quality. And also, as you mentioned earlier, this whole concept of COVID has really accelerated. A, a lot of, of this was happening anyway, but people are now joining the dots or they're seeing the red thread running through this concept of my air impacts on my health. You know, a few years ago, people said, well, I can't really see the air, or if there's our VOCs from, say, insulation, well, that's the insulation that's behind my wall. I can't see it out of mind, out of sight, out of mind. But COVID has accelerated this thinking, and it looks like we have turned a corner with, with COVID, very much so, and the economy, particularly the housing economy in the States, is really bouncing back and building back better, and that is fantastic. But I do think there will be many societal issues which will persist for many, many years to come because of this. An example, when people sneeze, we say, God bless you, God bless you. Um, and that's a hangover from the bubonic plague in London nearly 300 years ago. So we can see how society uh, is changed by these pandemics and how this will change our behavior for many years to come. And, and, and this slide, I think, is a really ironic example of it. The air quality, this is in Delhi, the air quality outside was obviously was very, very poor, a lot of pollution. And due to the lockdown and lack of activity, the outdoor air improved. What's ironic is if you look at the cyclist here in the screen, uh, he's wearing a mask because the outdoor air was so bad, he had to wear a mask. Now, many of us now need to wear face coverings and mask indoor but the outdoor air now is excellent. So there's this kind of uh, connectedness between the two, which people now will uh, join the dots more and more. So let's now try and speak about, say, our industry and, 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 and home building. You know, what is a home? You know, many years ago, it was about saber-toothed tigers and woolly mammoths, and a home is a dwelling. Um, as one of our, our clients from from train said it's where we keep our most important things like like our family for example our family members and then well what is health and the new world health organization definition of health it's it's no longer the absence of disease and you you don't go to your to your doctor just to be treated for illness anymore people go to their physicians to maintain wellness um, and that is very much the model. Uh, and also, it's not purely physical diseases anymore. It's our mental wellness, our social wellness, and the wellness of our community. That's where what the word health connotes going forward. And obviously, then you have the built environment. So if we bring those two things together in the modern world, in today's world, in this build back better world, what is a healthy home? What is a healthy built environment? And what does it mean? And how do we achieve it? 
And again, importantly, there's this new aspect, whether it's our wearable devices or our smartphones or the rise of meditation, uh, as I said, during lockdown, one of the key reasons people want to get the gyms up and running again was not for their physical health, it was actually for their mental health. And people are really now switched on to this mind-body uh, connection. The issue is, in this volatile world, with this uncertainty, with this pace of change, with this new technology, who can you trust? Um, and the reason why we're at this conference, why we've come together, uh, both virtually and in person, um, is because we believe we're leaders, we're the best in class of what we do. Um, and then as a trusted professional person in your role as a building professional, how do you achieve that trust and that capability? Again, Aaron in his opening did speak about this, the concept of empathic listening and really you know, not listening to tell people, but listening to actually understand them and provide better solutions. Um, and David Meister is a Harvard Business School professor has an excellent book called The Trusted Advisor. And he has actually come up with the trustworthiness uh, equation. And it talks about obviously credibility, which is your capability, your technical knowledge, your reliability as a professional. In intimacy there, he's talking about listening and really understanding and empathic listening. And then you can divide it all about self-orientation because if it's all about you and ego, well then trust really collapses. But if it's about M, about them, and the S is small, obviously the T gets larger and larger. And I think that leadership as a purpose-driven professional is the way we all need to think about the trust equation going forward. So, so how do we build that? Well, we educate in ourselves, we understand, and we understand technically what's important. And that's why we're so delighted to partner with Gord, because Gord knows how to do it. He's the man that does know how to do these things. And also, why is it important? So we invest in ourselves to become the best professionals we can be. And I'd like to really congratulate Aaron and his team. Again, I've done a lot of work with Luden um, with their academy. And they've, they've understood that education and credibility and being the trusted advisor is so, so important in these areas like energy efficiency and healthy homes. And the, they have a number of free resources and courses on there. Um, and I really would recommend it to, to, the, to the audience at the convention. Um, specifically, the one that we've designed, because as Aaron and his board asked us to do it, is the healthy home or the healthier home awareness for building professionals. And it's related to this, how do we build homes where people can optimize their health? And it's really the triumvirate of these three issues that have come together. We're talking about that understanding of health and wellness. We're talking about people's desire for homes and what is a home and what is a healthy home. And then us as the audience, how do we act as construction professionals, allied construction professionals, whether it's design, build, maintenance, use, and so on and so forth. Very much the wider uh, built environment community. And these are some of the themes we, we touch on in the program, which I think are really important. Um, I don't want to just give you loads of, of, of technical uh, data today. What I want to try and do is get a bit of a shift in thinking and mindset so you can reframe and ask again, what are the issues that are really important to my clients when I'm in a meeting and when we're designing and when we're actually uh, scoping out projects? So where I think we've come from is the blue dot, which is... Uh, how impact of designing and building uh, buildings impact on the planet and the outdoor environment. And really, you can kind of bucket that all into sustainability, energy efficiency issues, and obviously, absolutely uh, incredibly important, they're becoming more and more important. But where I see the new phases of development coming is really as now, well, now we've designed and built the building. What is the impact of that building, that school, that place of work on the people who actually use the building? And during the pandemic, our homes became our, our gyms, our restaurants, our boardrooms, as well as our family homes. So really turned up the dial on indoor air quality. And that I would describe that all in, as health and wellness rather than sustainability. And it's not about planet, it's about people. And I've heard it said that carbon dioxide is harming the planet, but really VOCs and using that as a proxy for the indoor environment is impacting on our people. And when we looked at this, you will often see that obviously indoor air quality and outdoor air quality, it's, it's, it's been an issue as long as we've been building buildings, way, way back in ventilation of, of Greek and Roman buildings to issues with, say, TB in the earlier century, in the Victorian buildings, and now later with the pandemic. Air quality and how we heat buildings has always been an issue. 
but it's been very much approached from less, and I don't mean this in any way disparaging, but very much from the point of engineering and quite technical about how do we deliver ventilation into buildings, heating, cooling, ventilation, and so forth. And then on the other side of the equation, you've got a lot, a lot of doctors talking about healthy indoor air. And they're kind of coming across the other way into the conversation. And they don't really have any credibility to talk about MERV ratings or ASHRAE standards or ventilation rates or heat recovery systems. Likewise, the engineers don't really have any credibility to talk about asthma, allergies, or impact action on people uh, around indoor air quality. And what we've done with our program is to build that bridge between, say, myself and Aaron and his team and his wider team at EBA, but then specifically from, from Gord. We've built a bridge for the first time, and we've got both sides of the house talking to each other with credibility, and not only um, about the medic aspect of it, but then about how we actually get on and build those buildings. And so our, the course program, we call it the Da Vinci Wheel, we based it on, and because Leonardo Da Vinci himself was a great thinker, used both sides of his brain. He was a great engineer, he could do great technical drawings, he, things like helicopters and so forth. But then he could turn around and draw the Mona Lisa and access his right side or his creative side of his brain. And I think many of the building professionals, such as the architects and designers and the wider building community would understand that you need to use both sides of your brain, very technically astute, but also very creative and very understanding of your customers' needs. Um, and that's how we've built the, the pedagogy or the content of it. We speak one side of the Da Vinci Wheel talks about health and, and medical issues. And then we very much talk about industry and innovation and so forth. Um, and the way I would like to put this is I'm the, I'm the why guy. That's, that's my role, my, hopefully my role in this convention today and having this great honor to open the plenary session. Um, and Simon Sinek has is, 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 is wrote an excellent book on this. It's called uh, Start With Why. Uh, a tip I give a lot of people is you don't want to have to read all the book. You can just Google his TED Talk. It's about 15 minutes and then you don't need to bother read, reading the book. Don't tell him I said that. But the most important thing is, is starting with why. Why is all this indoor air quality issue important? And that's kind of my role as a medic uh, and as, as my wider association with EBA is let's start with why. You get the why right, then the how and the what you actually do. Well, then Gord can actually tell you a lot about that because he's the expert there. But there's no point going off and trying to do loads of hows of what, so what we call over here mad how disease, if we haven't started with why. And if we get the why right, everything should flow from that. The other paradigm that we like, uh, we feel purpose-led professionals in your area really should be thinking about and wider industry is, and you'll see this across uh, big, big brands, retail, banking, all, the, all the, the major industries, is really what they call the triple bottom line. It's people, purpose, and profit. And that's, again, a little bit why we call this, this topic healthy, wealthy, and wise. But if, as a big home builder or as a big um, constructor of homes or designer of homes, if we're not thinking beyond profit, of course, profit is what actually drives no profit, no purpose. You can't actually function. That goes without saying. Um, but if we're not thinking about what's our purpose, what's our mission, what's our why, um, and then what are we doing, not only for the, our people as in our clients, but for the wider communities and for wider society, I think you're going to be left behind as other brands and other, other construction professionals move into this, into this area. So let's consider some other numbers within this, in this whole area. This is a fascinating slide that was presented at US Greenbuild um, by SLK Research. And they looked at the spending of the US budget. And we know that curve is going up. And we know many commentators would say that it's actually unsustainable and something needs to be done. But if you look at the amount that we actually, or the US actually spends in health, about 85% is access to physicians on medication, access to hospitals. And really, if you think back to my earlier slide, it's treating disease, it's reactive and treatment after the disease or the illness has actually occurred. But when they actually study what actually influences our health in society, it is actually our behaviors and our environment. And many of our behaviors are a result of our environment. And we are talking about wider things like the way we build communities and street lights and, and other aspects around safety in buildings. But it's, it's fascinating to think only 4% of the actual US health budget goes in to healthy behaviors, which are a constant of our, of our environment. 
The problem is, again, go back to the air quality, as I mentioned at the beginning, if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. Uh, we're kind of like this, the goldfish in the bowl. The goldfish is the last, uh, the last person to realize he's actually in water. In fact, he doesn't even know he's in water. Um, and if you look at the glass of the dirty water, we would never consider drinking dirty water, or we would never consider eating our food off contaminated plates. But by volume, air is actually the largest thing we consume every day, about 3,000 gallons per day. But it's not something we actually stop to think about very much until, I would argue, the recent uh, pandemic. And that's accelerated something that was happening, which was coming in from a sustainability movement anyway. Some of the trends that underpin this um, and why I think it's going to accelerate, I had the, the, the honor uh, to meet Bernice King, Martin Luther King's daughter, um, at the first ever, 2019, Barack Obama spoke at it, President Obama spoke at it, um, it was in Atlanta, and it was the inaugural, the first ever health and wellness summit at the US Green Building Council. I had the pleasure of actually speaking, again, unfortunately, virtually uh, um, at the health and wellness summit last week as well, it's supposed to be in San Diego this year. And really the, the key message there was, again, focus on people and health, not just sustainability and those other issues. And the fact that we live in this interrelated, interconnected world and partnership is a new leadership. And again, I think those themes that, that industry as well as government, and there are some issues around trust uh, around those areas, but people are more and more looking to our professional service providers um, in this interrelated, interconnected world for the new leadership. And if our built environment is so important, I was in ER, ER doc by training, um, it's pro maybe you, you know, innovate and go with me slightly on this one. But if we look at a whole spectrum of professional service providers down at the red end, the most reactive, emergent, you know, that's what an emergency is, something that's emerging, an emergent. Obviously, you have your trauma surgeon or your ER surgeon, then you have your hospital doctor, then your community, a family doctor, and then your nurse. And then as you move kind of not down the spectrum, but less and less reactive, more proactive and maintenance of wellness, such as going to your physio and 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 then your gym instructor and your dietitian and people involved in keeping you healthy. Is there surely at that spectrum, somewhere at the end, the building professional, the people who design and build and construct our, our homes, our schools, are they not on that spectrum somewhere? Specifically, if 80% of our health outcomes are related to our behaviors and our environment. The problem can be, though, that when we look at indoor air quality, it can be quite it can be quite overwhelming. You have all these names, and they come at you, and sulfur dioxide are very complex and be quite intimidating. And they say to learn a foreign language, you need about two thousand words, say to be fluent in in French or Spanish or Italian. When you learn a professional trade like medicine or law or like say architecture, other building professionals, you learn about three to four thousand new words. You're actually learning one or two brand new foreign languages when you become a professional person. Um, but what we've tried to do is really cut through that complexity. It's been my job. We've put our heart and soul into it. It's what I've been doing for over 20 years now, really to bucket that complexity down into three classifications to allow you to have those conversations with your clients, uh, but also then listen to their concerns and become that trusted advisor we spoke about. And then once we can get them bucketed down and chunk that information down, we can then actually put it down on a, on a, a spectrum again, um, looking at the axis being proactive and reactive, and then have meaningful conversations with your clients and kind of meet them where they are, not where you want them to be, and they should understand this better, meet them actually where they are and what they're understanding. And then you can take those buckets and obviously you've got building code and you can't have toxic materials and, and sick buildings and, and issues like that. And as you move up the spectrum, you become more and more relevant until you go above the line and you're now in the kind of proactive quadrant in the top right hand corner here. And you're now talking about healthy air, healthy homes. And we spoke about that mind body connection at the beginning. And really, I think that type of conversation, bucketing down the complexity is something that I think your clients would really embrace it and understand it. And then look at, let's look at some of the of other language we use in this. Um, if we take the word, for example, of formaldehyde, or we take PVC, or we take phthalates, things like that. In, in the life cycle of products, there are, you can use the word, say, production uh, ecology, or how, do, how does formaldehyde impact on the environment when we're making, say, 
their floor coverings, for example? Or how does phthalates and PVC and so forth um, impact the environment when we're disposing those products? And there's a lot of certifications, and I'll talk about those a little bit more in my talk. Um, but what I would ask people is, what about the in-use phase? People know a lot about production and disposal ecology, but what's it doing to the environment that's probably most important to me, the environment of my family and my home, uh, when I'm actually using the product in the in-use phase of the product or the in-use phase of the building, and how do we clean that building and how do we maintain that building? And it's the same thing, like let's look at the word CO2 or maybe look at the word energy. Um, when we're designing a building and then we're actually doing the build phase and we've got the design documents and the build documents and we have all our, our people who are going to collaborate on it, the constructors and the architects, the word CO2 has very specific meanings in, in those conversations and those design and template documents. But what does the word CO2 mean when we actually use the building? And then, uh, as we know now, people are using CO2 monitors as a proxy for ventilation rates uh, or carbon monoxide. Again, something else that can impact the building. And um, I mentioned I was an ER physician. Carbon monoxide poisoning is one of the things that really confounds an ER physician because their heart rate monitors and their uh, blood oxygen monitors all shows a very, very low uh, oxygen level. So they have hypoxia, but the patient looks pink and red and very healthy. And that's a classic carbon monoxide poisoning. And it's something that can, can get missed. And it's a real ER conundrum. So just like, you, again, words like formaldehyde, like sustainability, they mean different things when we're talking about the environment and then when we're talking about people. And the language needs to change slightly. So if we, if we look at a home um, and we look at where the classic, say, triggers and irritants for either somebody who's got hypersensitive airways, like allergic rhinitis or asthma or allergies, but just in the general population, nobody, um, whether you suffer from any issues, wants to have high levels of VOCs or formaldehyde and so forth in, in, your, in, your, in your area, in your home. So whistle stop tour, and I think Gordon and I later on, I'm gonna hand over to Gordon. Gordon's gonna do a little bit more about this, about specific things in each room from a construction point of view. But the, if you take the garage, it's going to be the fact that often people may even have the motor car running in there. That's often where people store uh, cleaning products and paint and things like that, make sure the ventilation that's not getting into the home. And um, where we spend the most time in, in our homes is actually the bedroom, you think about it, you sleep, roughly eight hours a night if you're lucky um, and that's then going to become things more relevant to textiles things like obviously classic house dust mite allergen and um, you get residual chemicals and irritants and pesticides on textiles which people don't often think about some of recycled bedding that use recycled acrylics actually from say plastic soft drinks uh, often that can uh, outgas more VOCs and say a natural fiber. So there's, there's, there's um, not only the design of the build and the build envelope and the materials like floor covering and paint, there's also then the incidental furniture and the product items we bring in. And then if you think of rooms like the bathroom is then how do we clean, ventilate, maintain, obviously potential for moisture build up there. We'll talk a little bit about zones in homes as well and optimizing moisture balance in various areas, but also VOCs from cleaning products and then how we ventilate. You have the base room and there's, there's traditional issues that happen in your basement. That's where obviously the furnace is. Many US homes are, are centrally ventilated and central air systems, unlike say in Europe and so forth. So it's good to do a room by room walk around and understand what are the issues as you design, but then as the family then goes to use that home, a uh, kitchen, for example, uh, can still have uh, naked flames for cooking, oil particulates from cooking. Sometimes people have scented candles. We're not a fan of those for two reasons. First of all, the, the, the fragrances themselves can be irritant, but often they're used to actually mask or cover up other issues like mold. And it's better getting to source control rather than using masking techniques. But we'll talk a little bit about, about the home a little bit later on. So just going to finish up now in a, in a couple of points. Um, if we're looking at either products or programs or building projects, I mentioned about the ecosystem of certification marks. And these are all excellent marks. In fact, we actually collaborate with a number of these organizations. And we use some of these as actual pre-qualification for our asthma and allergy friendly certification program. And you can kind of put these various certifications to look at 
different aspects of sustainability as a whole, looking at material science and chemical constituents and declarations, and you can look at carbon footprints and, and, and energy efficiency. And that is part of the story in any build project. These things all must be considered. What I would like the audience to, to uh, consider at, at the conference today is the concept of healthy. And where does healthy come into that? Because I would argue, while all these things are not quite business as usual, but they're kind of becoming what is expected. They're, they're not quite code. Some of them are beyond code and they're really premium, but they're almost business as usual and they're table stakes and they're red, you know, a red ocean kind of competing issue. The blue sky, the game changer, the paradigm shift, where if you can have the conversation in an empathic, informed, trusted advisor way is around healthy. And that's a little missing piece of the radar I showed you before. And I think that's where the leadership position is going to be going forward. Um, and there are, as I said, lots of maps. There's um, uh, ToxNOS, and this is the origin database. And you can see the, the asthma and allergy friendly one. We're, we're there because it begins with A. That wasn't any kind of optimization. But you can see how all these certifications and how the companies, I know it's a number of sponsors of today's program, are there as well. And you can see how they're all. Uh, they're there, but it's how you bucket them and then how you make them relevant for people. As I said, I think health is the one that's going to resonate the most. So finishing up on a couple of slides here, uh, artificial intelligence or smart homes. I know there's a number of speakers on it and I've, I know there's a number of modules within the uh, Eber Academy on artificial intelligence smart home this was the idea of something that was uh, a connected thing something wake up in the morning with a cup of coffee years ago but things have moved on so much more now we now have um, and i know gord is going to highlight a couple of really interesting technologies we spoke about earlier about smart sensors in homes and devices are able to kick in and everything so i'll leave that to gord but when we look at robotics robotic vacuum cleaners that they can sense dust they can switch on and switch off when they look at floor dust and, and airborne dust we have room air purifiers and conditioners that in local zoning can kick in and kick off. I think this whole idea of, of a smart home obviously is here to stay and is only growing. But what I would say is that artificial intelligence and machine learning won't just be about efficiency, making a building more efficient and making your toaster talk to your kettle and speeding things up and, and saving time. It will actually be, be about smart and healthy homes. And as, I, as we like to see, you'll see in my yellow right there, AI, you put a little R after AI and you get air. So artificial intelligence is all well and good, but don't forget about air and don't forget about health. Because again, as a physician, the old paradigm was about, was about treating people uh, for sickness and managing disease. Then it moved to prevention and preventing disease. And now where we're going to is actually predicting what will happen. And we, we, we now have patients with, uh, say, this, the Allergy Pal app, where they're keeping um, diarization, of their symptoms. And we know when their peak flows are, are trailing off, we know that's actually a positive predictor of a future asthma attack. And we can actually get the in intervention in there. We know people have smart speakers that are tracking their symptoms, as well as their air quality, as well as say products around the home that are actually impacting on it. Um, and so for example, you can get an alert, whether it's a train product or a furnace filter, and um, you can have this concept of negative downtime because you can predict where air quality is going and you can order something from Amazon and it arrives and there's never that lag in air quality which may cause the issue. So just to sum up, air aware for business professionals, the way we teach it is that whole concept of start with why, that's going down one side of the Da Vinci wheel and why is this important for people? How are you gonna have the conversations with people? How are you, we're not trying to turn people into doctors. We're trying to give people enough information to understand the issues that are important to them. And then as you come up the other side of the Da Vinci wheel is what do we do and how do we do it? And that's really why I hand you on to experts and people like Gord who really know now what to do. Now we know why we need to do it. So with there, I'm going to take a pause there. Uh, we can use the house gourd or you can take over the screen or hand back to Aaron uh, there. Again, apologies for the slight delay in, in getting, getting there, but uh, I think it's an incredible achievement to have three, not only three countries, three continents uh, together at this conference and uh, to get it all moving. So I'll hand back to you, Aaron. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. McKeown. I think it's... Um... 
critically, critically important for all of us to learn a lot of these concepts. Um, the healthier home, uh, you'll, you'll see that if you're in this room later on today, you'll see the window study that we've done with Shelton Group, uh, really asking homeowners what the most important thing is to them. The number one thing that comes up is we want a healthier home and we perceive you as a zero energy ready home builder or indoor air plus home builder or lead or NGBS or whatever system they're using that that is a healthier home. But then I, I think the other part of it is that remember the old days, you, everybody's worried about greenwashing. You know, you never want to say something that's not authentic or not true, right? So there's this concern around the health washing piece that we we're saying what's accurate, what's true, but also very informed by medical science. So uh, Dr. McCune, thank you so much for that. And uh, now we'll turn it over to a great friend of uh, EBA, uh, Gord Cook. Uh, many of you know Gord. He's been an instructor for EBA for many, many years. He, like me, is on many of our videos. I think every video we have has been redone uh, with Gord now. Uh, Gord features prominently in the Healthier Homes Awareness uh, course. So Gord's going to come on and take us through the building science portion of Healthier Homes Awareness. Gord, are you out there? I'm here. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, fantastic. Great. I just need to touch uh, Dr. John up. He's a health professional, but I don't know about his geography. Um, North American continent includes both Canada and the United States, so we're still just we're still just two continents, Dr. John. Sorry, buddy. See, Gord, I, Gord, I told him I didn't, but uh, it's my fault. Uh, fair enough. <laughs> we're, we're often left out, so that's fine. But of course, you know, Canada's mostly just a whole bunch of Irish people that were came over and uh, during the potato yeah, famine, right. so so we're we're basically part of Ireland anyway. Uh, but thanks you very very much, uh, Aaron and uh, Dr. John, and I just love those concepts. You know, that challenge, Dr. John, you and I talked about early on that I've always said to you, we're housing professionals. I've always felt just a little bit, I would say, uncomfortable talking about health uh, because we're not health professionals. It'd be presumptuous of us to talk about somebody's health. So it's really powerful that Eve has put this link together. I really appreciate that. But I wanted to give you a sense uh, just in the next 10 minutes or so, you know, just to give you a sense of how the housing industry has responded or is responding to this health issue. And for sure it's not enough, but at least let's lay down the basics of, of where we're at with this. And if we started with the building science goal, certainly building science could have been faulted for in say the late 70s, early 80s to be focused on energy efficiency, that's fine. But in fact, I think we've done a pretty nice job of saying it's not just about energy efficiency. In fact, it would be a problem if we just focused on energy efficiency. In fact, the building science goal would ensure that simultaneously houses are more efficient, healthy, safe, durable, um, comfortable, cost-effective, aesthetically pleasing, and sustainable. So the building science realm, at least, would say we're conscious of those elements. I'm also, um, in, from that building science perspective, understanding that, that air is part of the conversation. Heat, air, and moisture flow are indeed the basics of, of what we look at. So not necessarily the quality of the air, but the flow of air through buildings is always important to us. So the building science basics, we would say, at least are trying to capture the essence of that air component that Dr. John is, is speaking of. And I will just assure you, in, in, in my world, I would say, the, uh, the energy codes, or actually all building codes, have been really respectful of building science, especially the 2015 and 2018 have done a really nice job. And I'll give you a couple examples of that. So again, they're not, they're not of the building science components, respectful of the building science components. And I'm pretty proud of that as I read codes and builders need to be assured that, that in fact our co codes are respectful of the science, which means yeah, ipso facto, they're trying to be respectful uh, of the health side of things. And as a little example of that, you know, we would say from an air quality perspective, at least let's get the combustion safety correct. Aaron, you mentioned the move towards electrification, decarbonization, the burning of flames in houses. Let's make sure we do that safely. And you're starting to see things like on the top right, all electric solutions, or if you are using gas, direct vent sealed combustion, the furnace and the water heater to make sure we've solved combustion safety. My partner, Mark Liberté, the very first slide he always used to show back in the 80s is you can't talk about energy efficiency until you first make sure you have good combustion safety in houses. So that's a, a good building science principle. And then we would say next on the list is 
air tightness or air leakage control, that it actually helps indoor air quality. And sometimes people don't necessarily make that link. There are still people I meet from across North America would say, oh, you don't want to build them too tight. That's bad for air quality. But I always like to say, and of the building scientists of the world would say, really, how many holes do you want in the walls or attics of your house? How many bugs do you want in your houses? How much dust do you want in your houses? How much pollen do you want in your houses? Um, and this, in fact, gives you control over the air you breathe. And again, fascinating when I listen to, to Dr. John about, you know, controlling that indoor environment. And one of the elements of that is to make houses tighter. And you guys know, of course, that 28 U.S. states now require air leakage control measures in buildings. And that's a good thing from an air quality perspective. They are not opposed to each other. They are, in fact, synergistic. And then the code makes that link between um, uh, the, the air tightness of buildings or the air leakage control and the ventilation. And we do have pretty good standards out there. ASHRAE 62.2, uh, I know Dr. John uh, talks about it in his sessions as well, getting the right amount of fresh air. Now we do need to understand this is a minimum. There are people who are gonna need more. And I think one of the most fascinating aspects of the, of the course, Dr. John, is the understanding that some people need more fresh air than the minimum, but at least as a minimum, we have this idea of uh, fresh air for, for occupants inside of houses and that fascinating aspect of indoor air versus outdoor air, still people thinking that outdoor air how, uh, somehow is worse. And now we know that indoor air is in fact uh, worse than outdoor air. So that's pretty powerful. And then adding to that, the idea of controlled ventilation, mechanical ventilation, as opposed to just relying on windows that we know people aren't using as much as they used to. So what does ventilation look like? And great partners, Aaron at, at EVA always, you know, at the, at the table, uh, Brown, Newtone, uh, the Panasonic folks, and Dr. John alluded to, these folks have taken a step up. It, the first 30 years, we would say, just get ventilation into houses. Now let's get better control. And two of the leading companies now have sensors that will automatically determine whether there's an indoor air quality event happening or that you could turn systems on, you're cooking, the range hood comes on, uh, CO2 levels rise in the, ba in the bedroom, ventilation system comes on. So we're seeing really nice advancements on the ventilation aspect. First, get the right amount according to ASHRAE 62, and then let's think about controlling it in a way that really helps enhance people's lives and solves problems. And certainly we wanna think about enhanced filtration, lots of new technologies coming here as well. We see a lot of this during COVID. Our schools are now being um, uh, filtered to a much greater extent. And how do we bring those filter technologies without compromising, for example, on the air movement across uh, across furnace systems? So enhanced filtration is starting to make its way into the code. California, for example, has now a minimum requirement of MERV, minimum efficiency reporting value of uh, filters on, on systems in houses. So that's pretty powerful. And one I do wanna touch back on and actually ask Dr. John here in a second, you know, his perspective of what about humidity? A lot of our work these days is working in south, south the eastern climates for the most part, uh, talking about moisture, and I would say even mid climate zones, what is the right relative humidity in houses and how does that affect health? And the reason I want Dr. John's perspective is because I often have heard this over the years, I've been saying to people as a northern climate guy, you got to keep your house a little bit lower humidity because of condensation issues. And they will say to me, well, my doctor says I should keep the relative humidity higher. So I'll come back to Dr. John in just a second to ask him for that particular element. And one of the things that kind of, kind of embodies this whole element, at least a starting point, was the EPA Indoor Air Plus program, the the uh, the uh, uh, program that was in addition to the Energy Star program, we had this really nice checklist of moisture control and heating ventilation system, combustion safety, and making sure that we have radon resistance and so on. So this program with its checklist has always been very powerful. What I think you're hearing, you are hearing, is let's take that a bit further with the uh, Healthy Homes Awareness Program that, that Eva and Dr. John have uh, partnered with to just go further then, because some would say this is a little bit light, it's a great start, or, but perhaps just a little bit light. And when we think about strategies in houses, we, we counsel builders on using 
you know, let's remove pollutants and then think about source control, getting rid of pollutants at source, then ventilation, then filtration. Nice to see, again, Dr. John saying basically the same elements. Let's be really much better at choosing better products to remove potential pollutants. And then once we've done that, think about I, I would say I'm, I'm very pleased with the direction this the Healthy Homes uh, Awareness Program is taking us because it's simply adding on to what we've had a good understanding and codes as to the way things uh, should happen. And that does come back to this idea, if we can turn it back here in a little bit of a group conversation. Um, Dr. John, if I could bring you back in, the call I often get, and I suspect there's people in the room, uh, Aaron, you said there's 230 in the room, if, if they could just raise their hand, if somebody in the room has uh, a family member, a son, mother, son, father, uh, daughter with asthma, allergies, and respiratory problems, and specifically asthma, there's nothing more frightening, I would say, as a parent to see a child go through asthma. Aaron, are we seeing any hands going up uh, in, in the room? Yeah, it's probably 30%. Yeah, isn't that interesting? I do that question across the country, and it's always 30% uh, to, in my way of thinking. And the question I immediately get asked when I ask homeowners, is there anybody in the household with asthma and allergies? What should I do about, I do about it? And I always point to the bedroom. And Dr. John, if perhaps you and I could discuss or you could give us a sense, in addition to the base ventilation for the house, the base filtration for the house, Give me a sense of what the, the perfect bedroom would look like, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Thanks, Cole. Pre and listen, congratulations again on your slide. I'm always uh, impressed at your, your level of understanding of it, making it practical. Um, and, and just to, to, uh, to build on your raising the hand, I, when I do that, again, if you look 30% of the audience, if you were to say that by a household, all those people, they live in the home. There's probably, you could double that. So it's nearly 50, 60% by household. Um, but then if you ask everybody, well then who here in the room breathes, every, everybody has, has, has to go up. So <laughs> air is important to all of us. Um, yeah, I think the bedroom, as I mentioned, it, it's where we spend a lot of our time. Uh, I have a couple of teenagers now and they spend more and more time up in their bedroom. So um, I mean, some of them are surprisingly easy from a physician point of view, and then others can get more, more difficult. One is keeping it tidy, um, so lack of clutter and just general dust, uh, things like shelving spaces and the way you design, you know, not only uh, outdoor design and construction, but interior design as well. I know some of the well building lead and the other standards look at interior design. So some can be very, very simple. Um, and then others are more about... Um, uh, the, the materials you put in that we spoke about material science so you're talking about low emission from painting uh, furniture mdf furniture can often have uh, uh, vocs that, that can be admitted as well so it's it's how we live there on a daily basis and then what we put into it and then i would say some of the more construction stuff which would you would know more about which is like how we're going to ventilate that particular area of it and thank you for that. And Aaron, you come out of the HVAC world. Obviously, I come out of that world as well. There are some great new options uh, for ventilation. There's, uh, I would say we're going to see a movement back towards um, separately ventilating. That is not necessarily relying on our fresh air to make its way through the heating cooling system, but perhaps separate ventilation. I know in my case, um, I'm a big proponent of of the uh, uh, mini split or the ductless or small diameter duct, uh, small duct systems like the Mitsubishi type products and allowing those products to heat in cool rooms. But then in addition, let's bring in ventilation. So fully ducted HRVs and ERVs. And it's, to my mind, it's kind of like ventilation systems. We were kind of, uh, I would say, uh, ventilation vigilantes. And we talked about fully ducted ventilation and because of cost and complexity, most builders went away from that and simply use the, the ductwork to uh, of the existing furnace to, to deliver the fresh air. But we are seeing a movement back towards fully ducted uh, vent balanced ventilation systems like HRVs and ERVs to ensure a continuous amount of fresh air to bedrooms. And maybe, uh, Dr. John, you could speak to that. What is, from your perspective, have you got a sense of what is the right amount of ventilation, fresh air per person? Well, certainly, um, to answer your question about humidity, I think humidity is 
as a, from a physician point of view, we're looking at ba humidity balance. So we wouldn't be so prescriptive of a whole house, but we might revisit the concept of, of zones. I think you were touching on it there. Um, and I, I'm stealing your, your expression, a lovely expression that you mentioned yesterday about this concept of, of an oasis and having a certain part of, of, of the home ventilation being slightly improved in that area. And we may not need to do that in our garages or a playroom that's not being used and so forth. So I think zoning is going to be important and optimizing it. Um, the humidity question, anything north or above 60, um, you're going to have run into issues with condensation and which for us, for you as a, as a builder, let's say it might mean condensation. For me as a doctor, that equals mold and potential bacteria and other challenges. That, that's the outcome. Um, the problem is once you go below anything about 30, um, 40 to 30, you're then going to suffer from things like dry eyes. You're thinking like being on an airplane or a sealed building like that. You're going to get dry mucous membranes um, and that will then exacerbate irritation. And there is evidence that there's almost like a stacking effect. So uh, a, a biological like a house dust mite allergen or a cockroach allergen stacked on VOCs in the environment and then stacked on less than optimal humidity, let's say dry air. And we see it when we go out for say cold, you go for a jog in a smoky cold part of a city, uh, those changes as well. So um, I think the answer that it's just dust mites or it's just VOCs or it's just humidity are the issues. Um, it's getting a part of the house or a zone, or again, to use your word, an oasis that is actually balanced for all of those things. And we probably don't need to drive so hard in other parts of the house where we're not in as often or that it's, it's just not as relevant like the bedroom. Two really nice concepts. And just if I could paraphrase that, you're saying that range, humidity range of 40 to 60%, not over 60, yeah. not under 40 most of the year. Yeah. As a Northern climate guy, we would say, hmm, even 40 is a little tough for us on really cold winter's day uh, because we might get condensation on glass. But I always like to make the tie in, but that's exactly why you want to build a high performance energy efficient house, because in our market, you'd like to get to triple glaze windows, which are far more condensation resistant. In fact, that is a, a technology, a cardinal glass would tell you they can they can give you the, the condensation resistance of their various glazing choices. And you go to triple glaze, not because not just because it's energy efficient, but because it also allows you to have those higher, more comfortable, or in your case, Dr. John, healthier humidity ranges. Mm -hmm. At over 60%, of course, is, is an interesting one because uh, that gets really difficult for builders in the, um, in the Southeast. If, they, if we're trying to get them to ventilate, bring in fresh mm -hmm. air, they're bringing in really humid air. And again, the technology of energy recovery ventilation and dehumidification, uh, we're starting to see this uh, more and more is they need to design for heating, for sure, for cooling, for sure, for ventilation, but also for dehumidification. That in fact, there's four mechanical functions that need to be looked at independently and not just rely on the air conditioner to do the dehumidification, that perhaps separating out those functions. Aaron, in your world as an HVAC, uh, contractor, was that was that part of your design world? Is to think of those four functions uh, independently? Great, uh, Gord. I was an HVAC manufacturer, so ah. I'll leave it to some of the HVAC contractors. <laughs> but my I think the I think the great thing is the healthier homes awareness is there's lessons in there for an HVAC contractor to do that empathic listening um, to the homeowners. And there's great products that they can deliver if they, if they follow those guidelines. Uh, Gord, I'd love to. We've got a lot of questions coming in online, and um, and here in the somebody run up and ask me a question, and somebody text me a question. But I think it. You know, we all as builders or energy raters or architects, I think we understand. I'm building a zero energy house. I wanted to use Energy Star appliances. And what I'd love to ask Dr. McCune is, okay, now we're switching. We're thinking more about human health. How do we carefully select those materials for the house? Uh, maybe how do we think about that as builders? And then being around the two of you and going through this process, I've learned there's a lot I need to think about as a homeowner or we need to teach our homeowners. So how do we tell them things like, don't bring that cleaning supply into the home because it's going to create an issue. 
So Dr. McKeon, can you just kind of talk us through that new, really shopping list or how to think about carefully selecting products to bring into a healthier home? Yeah, yeah. I mean, first of all, I think what we're doing today, uh, which is convening, meeting, networking, sharing ideas, that's the best place to start. Because just like Maya D'Angelo, when, when we know better, we do better. So just the very fact that we're, that we're debating and we're saying, well, I, I know about this, et cetera. I mean, even Gore's last point, if you do get humidity, well, then actually it also brings material science into it because does the product allow bacteria growth to support bacteria growth? So it's really interconnected. So, I mean, I could say, obviously, our asthma and allergy friendly certification, consumer product mark is something to look for. Um, but there are, there are your programs. I think my, my takeaway, I don't want to push one thing. I, we saw some of the chat people asking about Delos and LEAD and some of your programs. I think the challenge is to get educated and make and make your own mind up and choose. There are um, the EPA have a safer choice program, good housekeeping, have a made safe program. There's a whole plethora. And actually we have a registry on our database and, and you can look at them and we put them on a on a rubric. And this one deals with uh, carbon footprint. This one deals with toxicity. This one deals particularly with asthma or allergies. Um, so there are databases out there and we can make make that all relevant. For me, I think the big takeaway is to, is to get educated, get involved in your academy, um, try and follow people like Gord and myself who are out there debating these issues, and then make your own mind up. What's right for your customers? What's, what's right for your business? Uh, but it all starts with getting educated, getting aware, getting some extra knowledge on board. And uh, I think now is a great time to do that. So I, I would start with education, and then you really will be empowered to make your own mind up. But certainly, Dr. McCune, there are the programs like no added urea formaldehyde or zero VOC, low VOC uh, component products. Um, also, if you, if you haven't seen on Allergy Standards Limited, you've certified quite a few building products uh, to that standard as well. So that's a great place. Would you say that generally companies that have gone through third-party certification through an organi organization like yours are going to be mm -hmm. providing perhaps a more carefully thought out product is that fair we, we, without a doubt i mean we, we get people that come to our program and and they're looking for a magic bullet uh, the reason why as an er doc i set up allergy standards is because it was to cut through the noise and the confusion that people had they were overwhelmed about well my doctor says this and i'm building a new home what do i do so we developed an evidence-based scientific program to to cut through the bad science and um, so when companies come to us and they say, well, look, we just want your mark. What they're really looking for is just a straight return on investment. And we say, well, look, go, go to get, buy some Google ads or take an ad out in the Super Bowl or something. The, the, the type of company we, we, we want are people involved in good corporate citizenship. They believe in creating shared value in society. And um, they believe that if they have put their product to a third party for independent review of peers uh, that they are actually a better brand or a leadership brand. They're not trying to compete on price. They're not trying to compete on marginal gains. What they're saying is we believe we have a technical advantage. We have a superior technical product uh, is performance criteria, it's suitability criteria. And we've sent it out to a third party body or we've got the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America to review it or an association with, with EVA. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the big brands and, and the, the people of purpose driven leadership realize in that interrelated world we spoke about that if their product doesn't keep their promise, people will get on social media straight away and, and, and people buy now. They don't just buy in, a, in a, an old way like it was a funnel, a, a, a I O U. And um, now they circle around like the, the recent paper on McKinsey. They do peer review, peer review before, whether it's. Uh, bookings.com or the, the restaurant review guys, then they make a decision. And then if it, the product doesn't keep its promise, they go back on social media and you don't get that loyalty loop. So I do think companies and builders who've got third party green and energy endorsements like your own, they, they say, we're, we want to be challenged. And if we can improve, we will improve. And I think they're, they're the type of, of companies will actually win in the future. Great. Uh, a lot of questions coming in around, you mentioned Internet of Things and AI. Uh, I just put an aware sensor in my own home. 
and I think that's been really instructive because we we don't think about that candle that you talked about until I get some direct feedback. How do you see, I mean, are the AI, IoT things something that we should be encouraging our homeowners to deploy? Should we be, as homeowners, be educating ourselves through some of those devices? And if so, what do you recommend around IoT and AI devices? Well, well Gord, maybe I might bring you in because you, you told me about, I think the members of, of the program, two, two, two new ones that are right out of the press that are actually right on point for that. Yes, exactly. And, you know, I, 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 it's kind of interesting for me because in the early days of IEQ, we would have said the sensors are more problematic than the technology. In other words, just go ahead and ventilate and not try to measure CO2 and so on because the sensors just weren't there. I think the most powerful part about the sensors now is they've recognized they're looking for changes. It's not the absolute amount of CO2, say, in a room or the VOCs, it's looking for changes in events. It's far more impactful for homeowners because in a properly ventilated house, for the most part, and properly filtered, the sensors don't necessarily go off because they never reach the industrial limits, for example, 1,000 parts per million. But what you would like to know is if the bedroom count's starting to rise, then you would say, hey, that's a surrogate. And you used that word, uh, Dr. John, earlier, using CO2 or VOCs as a surrogate or indoor, an indication of indoor air quality. So I think the most important part about the sensor technologies is one, they're more reliable. Two, they've recognized that they, they are using them as indicators of indoor air quality events or problems in houses that are now kicking on and making decisions. And again, up till recently, lots of companies out there were selling sensors online, but you couldn't do anything. It would just flash orange or whatever. And now you have major manufacturers, Panasonic, Brone, uh, and others that are saying, hey, we can actually do something about that. We can we can turn on a system uh, like the range hood when you're those cooking oils and so on coming from the range. And I love what you said, Dr. John. One, you've got the gas flame, but you have all those aromatics, those aerosols, and you go, well, those smell good, so they must be good for me. Well, they're not necessarily good for us, and I'd like to ventilate them out as quickly as possible. I think, that, I think what's really important to understand is sensor technology has changed enough that now it is time to look at them and, and start including them in your houses uh, as builders with good education because you don't want them phoning you back saying, hey, it went orange, uh, you need to come over. No, that's something you did. It, it's, it's an activity you had in your house. When we delivered the house, all systems were go, all systems were green. The activities that you're doing in your houses are what's making the sensor go off and you need to make decisions based on that. I, I do think that um, there is an opportunity there as well, Gord. Um, I mean, they are artificial intelligence and the machine learning. So they're not real people. Um, and some of the sensors are very good to tell what the machine to do, but they're not good at telling what people to do or get the people's outcomes. Uh, I mean, I certainly believe anything that can be measured with anything in a home that can be measured will be measured. And anything can be measured will have a sensor and any sensor will be connected. That's just the reality of the world we're going to be living. And I think even in say places of work, you're seeing um, lifts as a service. There's a, there's a lift company or elevator company that you only pay as the elevator is being used. It's connected and it's sitting there as an asset not being used. So during the night or whatever, so you're not paying it. So I think there's gonna be emerging business models in home. Obviously our electricity and water is metered, but I think other things will be metered. I think how much you use something may impact on your house insurance going forward. So I think the concept of sensors and measurement and them all being connected is not gonna go away. But what we really need to focus on is, as I said, let, let's not just make the house more efficient. Let's make the house healthier. Um, and then, as I, as I said in some of my slides, the technical sensors in the home, how are they connected to, say, the wearables on people's apps or their smart speakers, um, et cetera? So I think it's bringing the real intelligence, the human intelligence, to the artificial intelligence, and that will happen in the home. Um, you know, there's lots of fascinating areas in, in medicine, care of the elderly, you can have sensors on kettles, and if an elderly lady, she normally makes three cups of tea a day, the kettle isn't being used, that is an indicator of, of, of say, maybe getting sick with the pneumonia. 
Um, so there's some really interesting things that are happening in homes, not just slips and trips and emergency alarms. Just looking at usage patterns of, of a kettle will actually indicate if somebody needs to have a house visit by, by a nurse or a doctor. So I, I think sensor technology is going to bring a wonderful advance to the health of our, of our homes and our society. Great. Uh, I think next we'd love to talk about the master, or sorry, the material qualification program, the Healthier Homes Awareness, and the course itself, and then talking about offering for the summit attendees, both those in person and virtually, uh, a discount offer to uh, take that course. Uh, Dr. McCune, do you want to talk about that? And Gordon, maybe sure, you can chime yeah. in. Yeah, well, if I if I ever go to for we we have the the it's an online learning platform. Uh, we've designed it so it's it's it can be on your iPhone, it can be on your iPad, it can be a desktop. People are traveling in airports or they're waiting for a meeting, or even if they're say about to walk into a meeting with with a client and they just want to do a refresher on VOCs or a refresher on coronavirus, you can play that module again. So we've designed it really as user friendly. Uh, portable, there's some MCQ, MCQs, and we can talk a little about all the various accreditations, which is great. But yeah, we're, we're, we're delighted. I can't be there in person, but the people who are attending the conference, uh, there's a, a discount that I think Aaron will tell you exactly what it is. We also have the technology to uh, try before you buy, so we can, we can give you access to log into it. You can look at all the introductory modules and even watch the first module, which is a couple that are all around uh, health and, and um, some of the, the things, the innovation frameworks I touched on today. And then if you like the program, you think it is a good fit for you, you can migrate onto the, the, the platform so then you can get your accreditations and get your certificate. So there's two things, you know, just to uh, thank people for turning up today and making the effort is we're actually going to discount it, but we're going to give everybody an opportunity to contact Aaron and his team and you can actually log in, start downloading some of the PDFs, watch one or two of the modules. And if you think it's a really good fit for you and you want to have that in your iPhone, for the rest of your life, you can then just migrate onto the paid system and then you get all your accreditations. Yeah. And, so and I'll just pipe in, uh, yeah. Aaron, that what I found, again, so powerful in, in my career as a housing professional, always that little bit of discomfort when the health conversation came up. Mm -hmm. This program doesn't make you a health professional, but at least gives you a sense of what is the health profession saying. Mm -hmm. Gord, every time you glitch, Where do I, our two I, my heart meet? just drops a beat. <laughs> oh, I just was saying, Gord, Gord, every time you have a little glitch in your audio, my heart just skips a beat up here. I'm like, oh, boy. <laughs> but yeah, you know, we've even, thank you. We, and Aaron, we've actually even added in a bonus module, which is the uh, geography continents of the world as well. That's just a late addition <laughs> into the, the modules. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's, that's part of the quiz at the end. Uh, there which you go. There you go. You which continent does Canada reside? No, we love our neighbors to the north. <laughs> so the... The fun news is it's it's only about six hundred dollars Canadian, which is what Gord three ninety five U S. And I'm teasing Gord; it's not that bad on the exchange rate. And then we've been able to partner with ASL and Construction Instruction on this course, so there will be a twenty five percent off discount that we'll offer for that course. And I know we've had several firms that are doing this as a training program for their employees. We've had a couple. Um, big builders that are doing this as training actually for their architectural firms. Some are doing it as training for their HVAC firms. So we're kind of seeing, you know, I love what you said, Dr. McCune, about that's what EBA is all about. I think it's a place for all of us to come together to learn and share and collaborate around building science, around human health. And I think that uh, builders in particular are looking at this and saying, I'm going to bring in my real estate agent or model home salesperson. I'm going to bring in my uh, project soup. I'm going to bring in some of my team, and we're going to all come together and take this course. I know Doug, uh, Terry's sitting in the back. He took it with his team, and it absolutely blew him away. And I think Doug has thought fairly critically about um, human health in a lot of his homes. So we're really pleased to announce that. Um, we'll send an email to, out to everybody, uh, if that's okay, Nancy, and, and come up with that discount code for that course. Maybe not today, Nancy says to me. So... Well, that's great. Do we have we have a little bit of time? I think. Do we have any questions from in the room? I've been doing a lot of the online questions, but does anyone want to ask a question that didn't get answered? Yes, Sean Lamans from Mitsubishi. 
electric, heating, and cooling. Oh, I can hear you, Sean. I can repeat it. I can project. Ah, there you go. Um, Great haircut, by the way. Yeah, thanks. Just did it this morning. <laughs> Um, any suggestions on good um, testing uh, resources? So if you're if you suspect something going on in the house and mm. like I really want to get more information on this, I know that there's some like DNA based testing for things going on in the house. Any suggestions from the panel? That's great, Dr. McKeon. Did that one come through to you? It it did it did loud yeah. and clear. Um, yeah, I think I think for that is a, the old adage: if you think uh, if you think a professional is expensive, try an amateur. Um, <laughs> if if there's something that you're sus you know you're suspicious of radon, or there's a mold issue, or there's you know one of your kids, and, and we have seen this, we've seen you know kids working with their physicians, they're not responding to their medication, uh, they're missing days of school, and then they had an occupational hygienist or a professional to come out to the home, and they did a, a, a walk around and did a a health check of the house and they discovered look there was a, a mold stacky botrus or something in the games room behind the cupboard that wasn't detected and um, or there was some other allergen trigger there was maybe a pest issue that was causing trouble so i think if, if you're serious about it i think there are I, I wouldn't know in your particular area but there are people who will come out and do um home visits they'll do a walk around they'll do sellotape lifts they'll do vacuum samples They'll do air cassette samples and they'll run a panel of, of what, you know, the suspicions of things we have with symptoms. And it's remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable. Some kid has been on, on medication and treatment and it's not responding. They go to the home, they remove this trigger, this thing, the setting, and the symptoms and, the, and all the medicine goes away. And, and that, that's, uh, you know, something that happens frequently in this area, particularly where there's an allergic response. But it can happen to somebody who's just generally sick and it's, it's, a, it's an air quality issue or a vent. Somebody's divided a room and originally when the home was built, the ventilation was there and they've just put a temporary wall stud straight across it. So one room now is kind of in a carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide kind of dead area as it were. So I think if it's a serious issue, get a professional, get somebody who really knows what they're talking about to come out and do an assessment. There are rapid home kits. There is, there is a company we work with, Martin Chapman from Indoor Biotechnologies. And he has a, a kit they'll send out to your home for allergens and you do a vacuum sample. You get a little cartridge that goes on the end of your vacuum cleaner. You can vacuum your, your kid's bedroom or wherever the issue is, send it off and he'll do the top 12 allergens. So there are some send away kits, indoor bio is one, but something like this, I think it's really serious. And I think if, you, if, if you've got a resistant issue and you think this could be a home uh, exposure issue, get, a, get an occupational hygienist, get a professional in, and get a professional assessment done of your house. And if, if I could add, and thank you, Dr. John, I totally agree, get a professional. I'll add one question, Sean, to your, uh, when you're chatting with a homeowner. Do you feel better when away? That, that was a question that always really helped define whether this is something that's happening at the house or whether this is a general condition that, that they may be experiencing off to the doctor you go. So when we started asking that question, we are directed by a health professional to ask that question, actually. And then if they say, yes, we're always worse when at home, then it is the professional. And I would say a professional understands building science because, as Dr. John said, we got to find that mold. Well, we know that mold's always a symptom of moisture. So let's have somebody who understands building construction. What are, what are the moisture dynamics in the house? So that combination of a professional test and professional building science would, would be my... Um, just my adder to what Dr. John was saying. Great. We've got another live question, if we could. I think we have Joe. Joe. Yeah, yeah hi. I'm Joe with uh, Hayward Score. So my comment is to feed back on what you guys talked about. And it's, it's kind of a contradiction is that for most people who have issues in their home or have asthma, it is not the thing. It is not the register. It is a holistic approach, mm -hmm. which is what your foundation is. It's about you know moisture control and uh, air sealing and uh, control of the environment. So don't go in thinking that, oh, I found the thing. Mm -hmm. And it's well documented that people have issues in their home. It is not the one little problem here. It's not the cleaning stuff underneath the cabinets. It's a variety of stuff. So your background is key. In fact, just uh, change your narrative from energy efficient to healthy homes mm -hmm. and keep doing what you're doing because nothing really has changed. Thank you for that, Joe. Well, I love the, uh, the quote that Dr. McCune said, if you think a uh, professional is expensive, try an amateur. 
and we were really blessed to have two of the greatest professionals, in my opinion, uh, partner with us on this program. Uh, Gord Cook, again, Construction Instruction, Building Knowledge Canada, a uh, great friend to EBA, and uh, Dr. John McCune, uh, really the global leader in asthma and allergy and healthier homes. So I want to thank both of you so much uh, for spending some time with all of us. <laughs> Big applause here in the room. And again, check out the um, education session, and you can learn more at asthma, or sorry, Allergy Standards Limited. Uh, so, John and Gord, thank you again. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure, and thank you very much for the privilege. All right. Bye now. Do I have to stop it? Oh, okay. There we go. Oh, hey, we did it! Incredible. <laughs> That's the first one. So now we'll have all the breakout sessions that'll come out next. Um, so we've got, a, I think, a half hour break. Uh, there'd be coffee and, and some light snacks. And uh, But 10.30, I think we've got the six different sessions going. Now just remember for everybody, I, I'm stuck in this room. They've got an uh, ankle bracelet on me. I don't get to leave. But there are great sessions that I want to attend. I will connect with those on video. I saw a lot of, every, have any of you seen that Geico commercial where they say, don't be your parents? I'm at the perfect age for that. And you know, you're taking pictures of each of the slides. All of the decks will be available on the website for you. So you'll be able to review them. You'll be able to share them with your team members. So that's just a little bit on housekeeping, but now we'll start, to, most of the sessions besides this main stage will be up on three. Uh, the main lunch, when you come back, uh, if you're coming to the Housing Innovation Awards, that will be down here, you know, for our main luncheon. And I'm really excited. I don't know if you heard. I just I had to run back, but uh, the Secretary of Energy, uh, Secretary Granholm, will be here. She's coming in via satellite to introduce the Housing Innovation Awards. That's going to be amazing. Um, and uh, President Biden is going to be up at NREL today, uh, touring that facility. And I think it just shows. You know, regardless of what you think, there's a focus in this current administration on exactly what we're all trying to do, and that's really exciting. So have a great break. I will see you back here at 1030, and the rest of the folks are looking forward to seeing you in the other rooms. Thanks so much.